In exploring the theme of the web of life, I have thus far discussed two principal topics. First, the web considered as selectivity. Experience considered as what we pay attention to on the one hand and what we ignore on the other. And I showed how the way in which we pay attention to the world creates, isolates, I'm using that as a noun, isolates that we call particular things, events and persons, and they seem to be disconnected and to be alone because we ignore the connections between them. And I used the analogy of weaving where the threads go underneath and join on the back in a way that is not seen on the front. So you might say in the unconscious, although I don't particularly like that word because it makes it seem as if it was something rather dead, but on the unconscious side of life as on the back of the weaving or the back of the embroidery, there are connections which are not published. Now, in the second part of the theme was the web as mutuality. When I discussed the way the existence of a web, the existence of cloth or anything like that, depends on a mutual support of the warp and the woof. And this miraculous thing occurs that when the things support each other, uh, being comes into being, cloth comes into being. And so in exactly the same way, our world is a manifestation of relativity. And this requires a balance, a combination, a relationship of opposites in every d domain of life. And although these opposites are explicitly different and even antagonistic, they are implicitly one. And that's the secret. See, there are these two secrets that we went into. The connection between what are supposed to be separate things and events and the mutual unity between what are manifestly, that is to say openly, for purposes of publication, opposites. Now this afternoon I'm going to take two other aspects of the web. The web is a trap, like the spider's web is a trap for flies. Also, the lovely embroideries are worn by women as traps for men from a certain, <laughs> from a certain point of view. And I want to consider the web as something playful. You see, there are so many ways of looking at it. And you will find that all these ways are, are right. But what we need is the fullness of the view. There are people, for example, who can see the web as a trap and get stuck with that. There are people to whom existence is simply hateful. They see it as nothing but a ghastly mistake. The Lord really erred when he created this world because he, he arranged it in such a way that everything lives by eating something else. And what I'm doing is I'm describing a certain point of view, you see. I'm not exactly philosophizing. I'm describing a point of view. You can look at life in such a way that the whole thing is, a, is this ghastly mistake. For example, there is no such thing as genuine kindness or love. Everybody is really pretending that they are loving other people in order to get some advantage from them. And indeed, there is a point of view which occurs in certain forms of paranoia where people don't seem to be real. They are mechanisms. And you can think that out quite intensely with a good deal of intelligence. After all, if you start from a good old Darwinian or Freudian basis and see that man is a material machine and that the consciousness of man is simply a very involved and complicated form of chemistry, and that's it, what it is, you see. Well, then this awful... Uh, mechanical things, these uh, Frankensteins that everybody is, they come around and they say, well, I'm alive. 
I'm a human being, I have a heart. I love, I hate, I have problems, I, I feel. And you feel like saying, come off it. You're just a monster. Uh, and you put on this civilized act because really you're just a set of teeth on the end of a tube. <laughs> and you've got a ganglion behind those teeth, <laughs> which you call your brain or your so alleged mind. And this thing is really basically there for two purposes. One, to be cunning enough to get something to eat, to put down the tube, and the other, you know what, Mr. Freud's libido. And everything else, you see, can be construed as an elaborate, subtle way of pretending that that's not really what you want to do. But you do, but you put on a great show. Now, some people, according to this view, get mixed up. They so repress that what they really want to do is to eat and to screw that they get involved in higher things that are the masks for these activities <laughs> and uh, think that that's the real purpose of life. And then they become what's called neurotic. And uh, <laughs> because they get involved in being pure camouflage. So that's what's called escaping from the facts, not looking at life, not looking at reality correctly. Now, this is a very strange thing, you see, that it is partly true that the universe, so far as its biological aspect is concerned, is this weird system that lives by everybody eating everybody else. Only what we do to maintain what is called order and civilization is that various species make agreements, as it were, that they won't eat each other. They'll cooperate and so be an enormous gang which can uh, beat down the others. So the human being is the most successful so far of this gangster arrangement. We are the most predatory monsters on earth and we have cooperated to assault the fish and the vegetables and the chickens and the cows and everything, you see? Only we do it by not letting our left hand know what our right hand doeth. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, unless gentlemen happen to be prone to going hunting as a sport, they don't see their food killed. They don't see the slaughterhouse. And so what you get in the butcher in the market a steak, you know, is a thing in its own right. It has nothing to do with a cow. <laughs> uh, a steak is a thing shaped thus and so, and it uh, looks as if it might be like a banana or something like that, you know, and nobody worries. And when a fish is served up, it does indeed look like a fish, but it's not the squiggly, squirmy fish that comes out on the end of a fisherman's line. You know, when you really fish, you realize that the fish doesn't like it very much. <laughs> Now, there is that absolutely extraordinary side of things that is really terrifying. And so, let me repeat the illustration I used of the cross in the net, where one side of it is scissors that cut and eat teeth that chew and get this thing in, and the opening side of it is like James Joyce's in Ulysses, the girl who says yes, and I said yes, yes, yes. She wants to be absolutely ravaged by her man, you see. So it's open, open, open. But now comes the, the, the if we take the dark view of things, the horrible view, if, excuse me if I go into some rather gr grisly details, but have you ever heard of a vagina dentata? That is the idea that in the sexual organ of the woman there are teeth, and a lot of men have this fantasy and so are rendered impotent. They don't make love because they feel that the price of this blessed experience, this creative experience, this loving experience, is you're going to get trapped. You're going to get emasculated. You're going to lose your precious member. And uh, this is a very ancient fantasy. It appears throughout all known history because this is simply the woman's come on where she attracts but she is out really to get you 
She is basically a spider mother, you see, <laughs> who is, is selfish and uh, doesn't really love you. Not really, but says she does. And, of course, there are on the other side all the tricks of the men, which go without mention. <laughs> <laughs> So this is a view of the world as a system of mutual exploitation and of maximal selfishness. Now, it's a very profitable view to explore. <laughs>